Hello, everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen and friends. Good afternoon and a huge welcome uh, to you all. My name is Stephen Jaffe and I'm a consultant to Mag and David Adom UK. It's a huge pleasure to welcome you all to uh, our latest online presentation. We've had a, a very successful series of uh, webinars and online presentations. Before I introduce our uh, speaker this afternoon, Dr. Bernd uh, Wolschlager, I want to say a few words uh, for a few moments, talk about Mike and David Adon uh, UK. Uh, I'm very proud to uh, work as a consultant to MDA UK, which supports Mag and David Adom in Israel. It's Israel's national emergency medical uh, service. And if you're in Israel and uh, God forbid you experience a medical emergency or witness one and you dial 101, the ambulance or the first responders who will uh, come to you will be from Mag and David Adom. I'm sure uh, if you visited Israel, you will remember seeing the ambulances. And it's very likely that the staff in the ambulances are volunteers. Mag and David Adom is a very largely volunteer organization in Israel. Over 24,000 uh, volunteers for MDA. And they come from right across Israeli society. Every division you can think of, wealthy, poor, religious, secular, Jewish, uh, and Arab. And when I was in Israel for the last uh, time, it was uh, we visited the MDA uh, ambulance station in Sakhnin in, in northern Israel. And there I saw working together Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Druze. So, uh, you know, that is an aspect of Israeli society you're never going to see on international uh, media, but it is very, very true and real. Uh, Mag and David Adom, as well as the ambulance uh, service, also is responsible for about 97% of Israel's blood uh, donations. And that means it has a, a very strategic, important role to play, uh, particularly at the moment with uh, the coronavirus. It's through the uh, the plasma extracted from the blood that gives Mag and David Adom a very important role in the cutting edge uh, innovation in Israel to try and find uh, treatments and, uh, and vaccines. Uh, as well as that, Mag and David Adom does work globally. It's part of the International Red Cross, Red Crescent uh, movements, and, and therefore it can be seen working around the world wherever there is humanitarian need. And that can be in Guatemala, in Haiti, in a country like Indonesia, which, by the way, doesn't have diplomatic relations with Israel. It doesn't matter. It's to do with humanitarian uh, work. So I'm very proud uh, to be associated with uh, Mag and David Adom. I know that many of you will be supporting the organization already, and I want to thank you for that. If you're not familiar with it, please do uh, visit our website or our Facebook page. This afternoon, we're very honored to have uh, as our speaker, Dr. Bernd uh, Volschlager, uh, with a medical connection because he's a practicing uh, medical uh, doctor. Uh, Bernd was born in Germany. He converted uh, to Judaism, made Aliyah, means he emigrated to Israel and served in the Israeli Defense Forces as a medical officer. Today, he is a highly esteemed and honored family physician in Florida in the United States and also a clinical assistant professor of family medicine at various universities in Florida. Dr. Schlager has also written a book. Uh, in particular, uh, this book, A German Life Against All Odds, Change is Possible. It's a story of his life, and this is what we're going to hear uh, this afternoon. So I am very, very privileged indeed uh, to ask uh, Dr. Berndt to uh, speak to us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Stephen, for the introduction. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here via Zoom or St StreamYard whatever modality we can use to communicate. Um, I worked with Mark and David Adom. I worked on the intensive medic, intensive mobile care unit or in, in uh, Tel Aviv during the missile attacks uh, in, in January 1991 when Saddam Hussein launched 25 projectiles, got missiles in Tel Aviv. And we were outside with the ambulance from Mark and David Adom. So it serves all of us for the public health, preventative medicine, as well as in acute emergencies. And you're so right to say, Steve, this has nothing to do with ideology, with religion and faith. 
the people of all faith and all backgrounds work together under the umbrella of Magen David Adom. And thank you for your strong support and uh, allowing us to continue emergency care in, in Israel with the sophisticated ambulances that you provide. Well, I will not talk about my life as a doctor, even though I'm in my medical practice, as you can see, and I'm fighting the unfortunately losing battle against uh, coronavirus. I um, do it every day, and uh, in between, I talk to nice people like you, which I probably not see on the screen. But anyway, the reason why I'm here and talking is about my life. And I'm not talking about my life because I want to profile myself as the utmost moral, intelligent person. I'm talking about my life because I have a message for others that I understood and developed during my lifetime living in Germany. And this is the message uh, to have faith and to fight against evil. So how it all happened? Well, I was born May the 9th, 1958 in Bamberg, Germany. Bamberg is a beautiful medieval town in Germany, nestled between Würzburg and Nuremberg. It is a town that is a thousand years old and full of history, never touched by any wars. And in this town, I uh, grew up in literally surrounded by history in a living, breathing museum. So as children, we learned about uh, the history of the town. We learned about who lived where, what kings and queens and princes, and, and, the, and the only pope buried outside Rome, buried in Bamberg. So history was all around me. But one thing I was kind of peculiar to understand is that certain aspect of history was not talked about. The Second World War, we didn't talk about it at that time mostly mid-late 60s. And I knew as a child that something happened, a war happened. Why did I know it? Because there were uh, 20,000 American soldiers and family members stationed in Bamberg in the outskirts of the city. And they were an integral part of a community of 75,000 Bamberg citizens. So American soldiers were all around us and we had good connections and relationships with them. And I figured out when there was a war and there were foreign soldiers in town, obviously we didn't win that war that I was kind of deducting from the presence of uh, the soldiers. And I knew the war had impact on our, on our life because when I asked my parents about my grandparents, uh, I was told they were gone and they're not in this world anymore because of the war. So war shaped us, but nobody wanted to talk about it. Uh, slowly but surely, because I was a little nutnik, a little nerd and nagging my parents, my parents finally started to tell me about their history as it relates to the war and my family history as it relates to the war, the Second World War. And when my father started talking, um, he didn't stop. So did my mother. And I heard over and over two different stories, one for my father's side and one for my mother's side. When my father started to talk, we had long walks on Sunday afternoons together in the forest. He was a hunter. He told me, he taught me how to handle a rifle how to fish. We had a very close relationship. And he told me the story that he was the youngest tank commander in the German army in an elite unit under the command of General Guderian, the father of the German Blitzkrieg. And in every battlefront that Germany opened from September the 1st, 1939, the attack on Poland, my father's tanks were the first to roll in. And followed a year later, the attack on France, Belgium, Netherlands, my father's tanks the first to roll in. And then, of course, the almost fatal attack on the former Soviet Union in July 1941. My father's tanks were only the first to roll in, but he also pushed forward to furthest east towards Moscow and uh, stopped only by a by some village, some cities in, in front of Moscow, one of them called Orel, which my father conquered. And for that phenomenal, quote unquote, success, he was honored with the Knight's Cross, which was provided to him or by him by his Führer, Adolf Hitler. So I was eight years old, nine years old. I had no idea who Adolf Hitler was. I just knew my father was a hero, a knight in shining armor. And uh, the message that my father was a hero was reinforced by his old war buddies who came to visit our house at least once a year to celebrate the good old times. That's the way they referred to the war. When I sat there as a little munchkin on the chair, listening to these heroes, among them colonels and, and one general, that they adored my father and that they told me, you need to be proud about your father because he's our hero. I was proud of my father. There was nothing else I could compare it with. 
On the other hand, my mother told me a completely different story. The story of horror, of, of loss, of everything that was dear to her. She was an ethnic German, a Sudeten German, born in Karlsbad in that time, Czechoslovakia. And there were about 1.5, 2 million uh, Germans living in the areas uh, across the Western, along the Western border of Czechoslovakia and Germany. And as a result of the war, all of them were evicted. Many of them were killed. My maternal grandfather lost his business in a flourishing merchant business, a glove manufacturing business in the outskirts of Karlsbad. And the beautiful villa that they had, there was only a picture left. So for my mother, the war was horror. For my father, the war was glory. But there was something else about that war which um, made it kind of difficult to understand for me at that age. We lived in this massive two-story building in downtown Bamberg, 19th century patrician-style building, renting an apartment from the lady upstairs, the landlady, who hers, in her apartment was almost a, half of the size of a football field, a gigantic apartment. And my mother told me, whenever she talks to you, then you can answer, but don't address her. Otherwise, she's a noble woman. She's a countess. So I did. I didn't ask her, but I asked myself a question. There was this massive, big painting mounted at the wall in the hallway, right next to the wooden stairways leading to the countess's apartment. And this portrait depicted an officer in uniform with a knight's cross around his neck, officer's insignia on the shoulder, the officer's cap, Picture similar that I saw my father in on, on photographs at home, but he was, of course, a different person because his facial features were different. And when I asked my father who this man was, my father referred to him as the traitor. Now, I was nine, ten years old, a man in uniform who looked like my father, and my father who looked like him in uniform. Why can one be good and one be bad? There's something funny about that. And later I learned that the landlady upstairs, the noblewoman, was the widow of Count Klaus von Stauffenberg, the German colonel who was leading the assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler on the 20th of July, 1944. And his portrait was the portrait hanging on the wall. And later I learned from the landlady that this was not a bad person, but he was a loving man. How did I learn it? Because in Sunday afternoons, when my parents slept after lunch, I sneaked up the stairs, specifically when I heard her grandchildren playing, and played with them upstairs. And this apartment was wall to wall covered with pictures of him and her in as a loving, caring family father, a father of a large family. And how can it be that my father treated him like a traitor? A traitor is a bad word. That confused me. And uh, in school, we started to talk about this war. I mean, I was about 12 years old, approximately that time. So you're very early 70s. And what I heard was the following story. Hitler came to power in 1933, January 1933, democratically elected and then appointed by the Prime Minister Papen and the, and the president of Germany, Hindenburg. And he established immediately within three to four months a brutal dictatorship wiping away the fragile fa fragile system of the Weimar Republic and established a, a tyranny with, and which led to many people to disappear in so-called concentration camps or work camps. Hitler started on the Nazis, of course, started the first, excuse me, the Second World War. And as a result of the Second World War, 50, 60, 70 million people died, among them 6 million Jews as collateral damage of war. Nothing about the Holocaust. And on the 8th of May, 1945, the Nazis capit capitulated, or Germany capitulated. And then the Nazis disappeared like huff and puff, like a bunch of Huns that invaded and disappeared. So that was, of course, not the right story. That was not the correct story. But it was a story to explain the Second World War to us. And then in 1972 came an event that shaped in the entire history, my history, my understanding of the history, and shaped also the, my, the course of my life. It was the Olympics in 1972. And you would ask yourself, what have the Olympics to do with history at all? Well, in Germany, it had a lot to do with history because of the first time since 1936, West Germany, the democratic Germany, separated from East Germany by the Iron Curtain, communist Germany, hosted for the first time the Olympics as a democratic nation. And we were prepped to understand that this was a historical event. 
And it was compounded by the fact that we had a democratically elected chancellor, his name was Willy Brandt, who was elected in 1969, who was the first post-war German politician, not tainted by the past. He was a victim of the Nazis, not a perpetrator. He was a socialist, Willy Brandt, escaped in 1933 to Norway. And when Norway was occupied by the Germans, he escaped to Sweden. And he returned in 1948, 1949, back to Germany to rebuild, in West Germany, to rebuild the Social Democratic Party, as it was called. And he, in a landslide victory in 1969, was elected as the first Social Democratic Chancellor in the West Republic of Germany. And he was the first politician, West German politician, who traveled to Poland in December 1970. And in front of the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial in Warsaw, in Warsaw he sank on his knees, bowed his head and asked for forgiveness what Germany did. Now, this was a huge event. And my father's reaction was so telling. The picture of the chancellor kneeling in front of the memorial was posted in the, right on the front page of our newspaper. And my father slammed the newspaper on the breakfast tab table, yelling and screaming, Schau mal hier, look burned, again a traitor. Now, I was confused because my mother was an Orthodox Catholic. She erased me in the Catholic faith. My father was a Protestant, and she sent me to Catholic elementary school, or first kindergarten, elementary school, and she wanted me to become a priest, so I was an altar boy. The priest business didn't work out, but I was an altar boy. And uh, for me, kneeling in front of a memorial was naturally a sign of devotion, a positive sign. Why am my father so angry? And then the same chancellor in 1973, in 1972, opened the Olympics in a beautiful August day to a great fanfare. And I remember my parents purchased the first TV, black and white though, and invited friends over. And it was a joyous atmosphere, fine food, wine, beer. And everybody applauded when the teams paraded in the stadium, characterized by the respective national flags. And suddenly one team paraded into the stadium, carrying a flag with a star inside. And at that moment, everybody felt silent. Nobody said a word. It was the do not ask a question moment. And I thought, that's weird. It's just another team, another flag. I had no idea who this Israeli team was, what Israel was, what Jews were. The only thing I knew about Jews that they killed Jesus, that he was taught in, in, in Sunday school. And then 10 days later, the catastrophe happened. The same team that paraded into the stadium was brutally attacked by a group of Palestinian terrorists in the Olympic Village, two Israelis were slaughtered, butchered and during the attack. The remainder were taken hostage. And the German government, deeply embarrassed and shocked that Jews were captured and killed on German ground, on German soil, dispatched highest ranking government members to negotiate with the terrorists. One of them was, it was Genscher, our former foreign minister, and negotiated face to face with Issa, the terrorist leader, asking, begging to release the Israeli hostages, offering German gov members of the government, he himself at first, as hostages. The terrorists refused. They demanded to be flown out with a German Boeing 707 from a military airfield in first and Philbrook to an Arab country of the choice, demanding that Israel release hundreds of Arab prisoners from, his, from, this, from Israeli prisons. And then an exchange should take place in an Arab city of the, uh, probably Cairo or Libya, Tripoli. And that did never happen. I remember beat by beat how it played. A, two helicopters landed in, the, in the, nearby the Olympic village. Um, the terrorists uh, loaded the hostages in each helicopter and accompanied by the terrorists, flying to the nearby military airport, first in Felbrook, in the middle of the night, of course. And suddenly all hell broke loose. Firefight, night sky lit by explosions, firefight lasting for two hours at least, and then deafening silence. And suddenly a picture of it appeared on the screen. An American journalist turned towards the camera and said the simple sentence, they're all gone. What happened, the German police tried to liberate the hostages against the advice and begging of the Israeli Mossad Kidon troops on the ground, special units of the Mossad, and the chief of the Mossad, I think Ben Yitzhak was on the ground too, and uh, he begged the Germans not to fire on the terrorists because they're dealing with elite soldiers. But the Germans refused. They shot, tried to liberate the hostages in the ensuing firefight. The one terrorist threw a hand grenade in a helicopter, which exploded, and everybody perished, burned to death. 
The other helicopter they sprayed with machine gun fire and everybody died. And the next day in the newspaper, front page, a picture that changed the course of my life. Two helicopters on the tarmac, one burned out with the charred remains of the Israelis inside. The other helicopter with the bodies of the Israelis slumped over the seats and a huge headline, Jews killed in Germany again. Now I was confused. What do you mean again? I asked my father, what does it mean? And my father yelled and screamed, Schau mal her, was die an uns antun. Look what they are doing again to us. There's always trouble with those Jews. So the victims as perpetrators and the perpetrators as victims. And next day in the school, we started to talk for the first time about the real story of the Holocaust, the real story of the murder of the Jews. And for the first time, I heard the name Auschwitz, Birkenau, Eichmann, Mengele, the final solution, the murder of six million Jews, not collateral damage of war, but the murder of six million Jews as a government policy of the German government of the German people. I was shocked. And when I came home, I told my father, look, in the school, we started to talk about the Holocaust. What can you tell me about it? My father looked at me, said, it's a lie. Holocaust is a lie. Your teachers are communists. Believe me, never happened. And he was caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, my father telling me that this is a lie. On the other hand, my teachers, whom I trusted too, they tell me the truth. Something is wrong here. And for whatever reason, curiosity driven, of course, I started to read as much as I could about that time. And the more I read, the more I had the sinking feeling, there's something wrong with my father. He hides something, he's hiding something. And I start, tried to talk, get the truth out of him, but he would not talk to me about that topic unless he was drunk. I'm a child of an alcoholic parent. And I learned that in the first part of the day when he was looking for a drink or in the late afternoon, he was grumpy, restless, irritable and discontent. In the, third, in the last part of the day when he was drunk, I couldn't talk to him. But in the early evening, when he was a little bit tipsy or shicker, I could actually get something out of him, manipulate him for money and everything I wanted. And I could try to ease out, tease out the, what the history that maybe he will tell me about. And his de description of the past can be separated in three phases. Phase one, he told me, look, Bernd, what allegedly happened during the so-called Holocaust, we didn't do it. We mean the Wehrmacht, the army. It was all the SS. Now, that was a blatant lie. Many years after his death, I found a picture of him sitting next to Heinrich Himmler in a conference in the East, 1942. And if a highly decorated German, may, uh, he was, I think, lieutenant colonel at that time, when a highly decorated German officer of a tank unit, of an elite tank unit, is meeting with Heinrich Himmler, it was not about tank tactics. It was about securing areas, kill zones, murder of Jews, shootings, mass shootings. Then the second phase of, of what he described to me in answers was, was as follows. Well, whatever allegedly happened there, you have to understand that we had to kill people because according to the Geneva Convention, civilians in arms can be killed. That's just the Geneva Convention. It played according to the rule. They were not soldiers. So I ask him, first of all, it's a nonsense answer. I ask him, you tell me that 1.2 or 1.3 million children, Jewish children, had, were in arms against the mightiest German army on the planet at that time, the German army? You don't tell me the truth, don't you? And then the last phase, he admitted what happened. He was drunk at that night. He told me, look, you are too weak. Your generation is too weak. The whole world is too weak. They should applaud us for take, taking care of the dreck, the schmutz, the dirt. That's it referred to the Jews. We cleaned it all up, and now they complain about that. Now, that was the last straw that broke the camel's back. I not looked up to my father in a way that he was my hero, that he was the knight in shining armor. He was a murderer. And I turned away from him. And I wanted to find out the truth. And one of my teachers, a former Jesuit priest, said, Bernd, whatever you try to deal with, the only way you can clean your heart and continue living is to make amends. Amends to the Jews, I responded. Yeah. Oh, but I don't know Jews. He said, I will get you the opportunity, I will give you the opportunity to meet with Jews. He belonged to a progressive wing of the Catholic Church, and they invited over Jews and Arabs from Israel to come together in Germany to learn about themselves, to learn about peace, and to, uh, to in, always invited a German student or two in order to compare their history with our history. And I was for the first time together in a seminar with young Israelis, Jews and Arabs alike. 
and uh, we not we talked about uh, what we like, what food we like, what books we like, what music we like. I liked the Israeli girls a lot, so I bonded with one girl. And uh, she said, look, Bernd, maybe you're going back in a few days, but if you really want to have something serious with me, you need to come to Israel. I was completely infatuated. It was kind of this puppy love feeling. I said, absolutely, I will go there. Now, there was a problem. I had no money and no passport. And in the following two to three months, I got a passport. I got some money to summer jobs. And in 1979, in 1978, in summer of 1978, I hitchhiked to Israel, which I do not recommend. I took a train to Munich uh, from Munich, actually I hitchhiked to Munich. From Munich, I took a tramp uh, across the Alps to Ancona, the Adriatic port city in Italy. And from there, if, on the deck of a ferry that was not a cruise ship, I don't recommend it either, was a four-day trip to Haifa. We reprovisioned in Piraeus, and in Piraeus, I sent a telex that was before Google Schmuggel and all the good stuff, and notified her that I will arrive in that and that day and that and that time. And she waited for me at the harbor. I was overwhelmed to see her, but on one hand, on the other hand, I was asking myself, what if somebody recognized my name and my father did something to that family? I was fearful, but all the fear was blown away. And when she took me by my hand and said, let's take the Shirot, the community taxi to my home. And home was a small apartment in Neve Shanan on the mountain of Carmel Mountain in Haifa and working class neighborhood at that time. And her parents were waiting for me. They were waiting for me outside. The, the building, and they actually prepared a room for me in this tiny little small apartment. And her father took my rucksack away and said, you stay here with us. And they spoke Yiddish. I had no idea what they were talking about. And during dinner time, her father tried to talk to me. And he noticed that I don't understand or barely understand. So he looked at me in my eyes and said, look, I will speak in German. And he talked to me in German. I asked him, how did you learn German? He looked at me rolled up the sleeve of his forearm, showed me the number tattooed, and said, I was ich war in Lagern, I was in the camps. And he told me his, his history about him in the camps and then staying in Germany in a displaced person camp and immigrating to Israel in 1948. And he told me, I have nothing against Germans. Not all Germans were monsters. But what do you know about that time? So here I was as a young German First time in Israel, first time in a Jewish home, first time in a home of a Holocaust survivor. And I looked at him and said, look, I don't know much about it. Probably not enough that, that I shouldn't learn more. And he took me a few days later to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial. And there, by, took me by the hand, walked me through the exhibit, and I emotionally collapsed. I could not understand. I understood what happened. I don't understand how my father was part of these murderous gangs, killing Jews and slaughtering Jews. And they have no prejudice against me. What are these people in a positive sense? What are they doing? How they survived? How they rebuilt their, their lives, their professional lives, their personal lives? How did they rebuild a nation, old nation anew? I want to learn more about it. And I decided in Germany to approach a Jewish community center to uh, learn more about Jews. It was difficult because there were not many Jews, excuse me, <clears throat> not many Jews left. And a small Jewish community in my hometown actually provided me the opportunity to enter Jewish community life. I remember I knocked at the glass door, and which was the entrance in a hidden part behind the behind the courtyard of an old building. So this hidden entrance, I knocked at the glass door, and an old man opened the door. He was very pale, and uh, looked at me and said, "Was Wilste?" And I must have rambled some story together that he felt comfortable to let me in. And I remember sitting in his office, curtain drawn, windows closed. It was a hot summer day, no air condition. He was very pale, had a short sleeved white shirt on, and the number tattooed on his forearm stood out on this white skin. And I stared at it. And he said, Look, there's nothing to stare at. This is Auschwitz. My name is Itzhak Rosenstein. I'm the chair of the Jewish community. I survived Auschwitz. And what do you want? And I told him my story. And he said, Look, it's a very sad story. If you want to talk about it, I listen to you, take a book, and learn some more. So look, I learned everything about it. I want to help. So help, what kind of help? So said, can I do something for you? And he said, look, if you want me to teach you, you need to give me something back. It's a geschäft, a business. So I will be, you can be our Shabbos guy. And in return, I will teach you. I had no idea what Shabbos guy meant, but it was it sounded like a good deal. And so every Friday, I came, the first Friday I came, it was 6.30, like he told me, and I stood there in front of the dark building. He came at 7.30 and looked at me and said, was Wilste, I told you, 6.30, it's 7.30, 8 o'clock, 
un unload this German habit. We are not that precise here in, in our business. And um, I became a Shabbos guy. Week by week, month by month, holiday by holiday, year by year, I grew into this family of choice away from my family of origin. And uh, it came to a total breakup. I remember five years later when uh, I didn't show up for Christmas, which fell on a Friday night. And um, my mother, maintaining a very strictly Orthodox Catholic household, was, high, was devastated that I didn't show up. When I showed up the next day, um, I uh, my father was yelling, my mother was crying. And I told my father, look, I will not participate in the celebrations anymore. You have your white, you have your dark suit on, on your beautiful white shirt that you starched shirt. You place this nasty metal around, which you call for, did you get for honor? He didn't get it for honor. You got it for murder. It's blood stained. You're murder. He looked at me and said one word, Raus, get out. Well, there was one problem. I had no Kesef. In Kesef, uh, it was the second to last year of medical school. I had a scholarship though, but I still ran short of money. And Itzak must have noticed something and told the others because I never asked for money. One of the members who never talked to me came to me and looked at me and said, look, uh, du bist a goy. I said, that's very perceptive. Your name is Bernd. I said, yes, it is. Here, take the 100 mark and kauf the neue Sachen, buy new stuff because your shirt is dirty, your shoes are dirty, which was not true. And he gave me the 100 dollars and 100 marks. And I went to Itzak and said, Itzak, Aaron gave me 100 marks. I said, Aaron gave you 100 mark? He's a stingy. Um, and I said, well, he gave me that money and I should buy new stuff. And he said, did you ask him for 200 at least? I said, no. I said, because you're a goy. I said, what do you mean? He had this wicked humor. I said, sit down. You don't understand yet what it happened to us. Physically, yeah, but emotionally, all of us are burnt. I t carefully recrafted my life. But Aaron, the only thing we know about him, that he was in Auschwitz and a, he had lost all his family. And Aaron became my friend for the remaining six months that he was alive. And he told me the story about death and murder. And he was a member of a Sonderkommando, which I really want to spare you the story. And when he died, I was asked to say Kaddish at his graveside. And I told Itzak, I can't. I'm not a Jew. And Itzak looked at me, you're one of us. And when I said Kaddish at his graveside, which I knew by heart, something happened. I crossed the line. And I told Itzak, I want to become a Jew. Itzak said, it's a bad idea. He sent me to a rabbi in Frankfurt and said, I've sent you to a rabbi, stay as long as you want. I pay your hotel, pay your food, but don't come back with this crazy idea because you can be a Gertzedek, but don't be a Jew. And I learned with a rabbi who refused to, to, to discuss with me conversion, as Itzak told me, but he agreed to me to teach me. And uh, every day, every month that I met him, I asked him about conversion and he gave up to deny me that until March of 1986. And he told me, look, I would send it to a rabbinical court in, in, which will convene in November this year. And until you get there, you have to do some minor changes in your physique. One of them involves a plastic surgery. I don't want to talk about it. And uh, in three months later, I have to undergo, you have to undergo an immersion in the mikveh, in an Orthodox mikveh, which I did in France. And the procedure, the Brit Mila, I did in uh, Basel in an Orthodox Jewish hospital. And in November 1986, I underwent a halachic conversion in Germany. And I knew across the line when the rabbis bestowed upon me the honor to join after hours and hours of questioning, the chief rabbi asked me, what do you want to do, Bernd? I said, I want to go to Israel. Why do you want to do that? I said, I want to give back what was taken. And I can give, I have no money. I just want to give something back, fighting for the country that my people tried to destroy. And that's what I did. I applied for the Israeli citizenship. Uh, within a month, I got uh, the issue the visa for as an Oleh Hadash, according to the law of return, I immigrated to Israel, tried to say goodbye to my parents tonight. Nobody opened the door. My father was yelling and screaming that I should get the hell out of it, standing behind the closed doors. My mother heard her crying. And I arrived in Israel, was six months in the kibbutz, learned Hebrew, was one year in, the, in an Israeli hospital to get my German license up to par to Israeli standards. And then I joined the army, uh, was joined, I was drafted became an officer and was sent to a military base in the occupied West Bank. At that time, it was the beginning of the first Intifada. And here I was standing in front of my group, the commanding officer referring to me as the doctor. I was a lieutenant. And I asked myself, if they find out if that I am a son of a Nazi in drag, so to say, they kicked me out of here. And I decided not to talk about my life ever again. 
I threw my life in his virtual closet, slammed the door, locked the, the, door, the, uh, the lock, and tried to throw the key away. And I didn't tell anybody until my son Tal asked me, he was about 13 years, 14 years old, simple question. Abba Mia Sabashali, father who is my grandfather. And he had to be clean. I had to ask, I had to explain it to him, but it was so difficult because his father, who's truly is Jewish and Israeli, served in a combat unit in the Israeli army. And on the other hand, my father, his grandfather, was a Nazi, a murderer of Jew. So I told him, and he looked at me and said, that's a cool story. Let me tell my friends in school. I said, don't do that. Jewish school in the United States. And uh, I didn't know that they had a family history day uh, three weeks later. And during the family history day, it was reported that my son raised his hand proudly and said, my father, my grandfather was a famous Nazi. And then Needless to explain to you that this would definitely result in a call from the principal's office. And I had to go there immediately. And the principal told me, your son Tal told us that your father was a Nazi. What is wrong with him? And the rabbi was present too. And I said, there's nothing wrong with my son or about my son. I told him the story, which is a true story. And I told him again. And the rabbi looked at me, did you ever talk about it? I said, no, I don't. Do it. And he took me by my hand, walked me into his classroom and said, talk. And he knew what he was doing because he knew that I was suffering from this story. Because in the moment I talked about it, the weight was lifted off my shoulders and I yearned to go back home, which I did with my son a few months later. For the first time in 20 years, I returned to Germany, vis visiting my parents at the only place I could visit them, at the graveyard, cemetery. Cemetery, their graves are actually located right next to the wall, one row when you ever go to Bamberg, that is board that separates the Jewish from the Christian cemetery. When you look for my parents' graves towards that wall, you see on the other side the gravestones almost defiantly casting the shadow to the other side. And here I was standing with my son in front of my parents' grave. I was choked up and said, look, Tal, they still rest in the shadow of history. I was born in the shadow of history. I stepped out of the shadow, turned back to learn the lessons that when I move forward and never will do the mistakes again. I don't have to be in the cast of the, of, in the, in the shadow of this of our past. That's what I did. And the reason I'm talking about it because I experienced that everybody can change, that I do not judge people by who they are, from where they're from. I'm a German. I'm from the family of a murderer, but I decided to live a different life. And the power of the individual that is my first message to change secondly i learned something from my father that i never thought that i would learn from him that words have consequences hate is not this amorphous dark matter in the universe that we cannot see but we know it's there hate is something that we generate is words of hatred and if these words of hatred fall on the fertile ground because they're left unchallenged they sprout into deeds if these deeds left unchallenged they form habits if these habits prevail then individual's character will be shaped and norms will evolve that makes it normal to kill Jews. It was normal to kill Jews. Everybody knew. They just didn't consider Jews as humans. And I do what I can do to speak virtually or, or, or locally or wherever I traveled in the world about to start, tell my story, not because it's about me. It's about the power of words and it's happening again. Words of hatred, words not only involving Jews, words in, of hatred against Muslims, words of hatred against anybody that is different. And if we don't stand up and educate our children to speak up or ourselves to speak up, we are doomed to repeat it. And I'm not into politics and it's not my political talk, but we have dynamics in, in the world happening, political dynamics, which makes me very, very uneasy, makes me very, very concerned and double my effort to speak up because against all odds, change is possible. And if you believe that change is possible with the power of the word, then let's use it and, and do it. Thank you very much. And I know I'm a little bit above time, but uh, thank you for your patience. Brian, thank you so much. I mean, that was beyond fascinating. It, it was very moving. You know, the as you say, the individual, a determined individual like yourself, you know your determination to change for your for your own sake and, and, and what you've achieved. Uh, can I ask anyone who has questions to to leave comments? Uh, and I'll uh, relay the, the questions to Brent. But uh, a question that uh, is mm -hmm. 
thing I, I really want to ask is there are, of course, thousands, let's be honest, tens of thousands of German people of your generation uh, with similar family histories. And how have they coped with that? Uh, obviously, your story is, a, is, I wouldn't say necessarily absolutely unique, but very, very uh, unusual. So what, how have other families uh, dealt with this kind of uh, family history? Um, everybody in his own way. Um, I belong to the first generation of Germans after the war, first and a half. And each of us had had to deal with the gravel with the past. I, for example, in my class, there was one a, one student, um, one of my friends, school friends, whose grandfather was General Yodel, um, who actually uh, ki was killed in the last month of the war, but who was in, a, a murderer too. Um, I had uh, various situations where we talked about my friends, about specifically when the movie The Holocaust was screened in 1979, the TV series, uh, and before the first time we were confronted in, in a Hollywood fashion, of course, about the impact of the Holocaust on the Jewish people and our people, there were many in my my friends that either said a different reaction. Either they said, look, this is terrible, but I didn't do it. Then others said, it's terrible and I feel responsible. And I said, and people like me said, it's not only terrible, I have to do something that it never happens again. So we all were impacted and none of us was untouched by the horrors of the Holocaust. And nobody was making, well, some people made jokes about it in order to deal with it. I don't condone it, but um, if the, our generation was shaped by the past to create a better future. And some people are, are asking about the book. Uh, where can they buy it? I assume it's on <laughs> Amazon. On yeah. Amazon, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I did check it's on Amazon UK, so so people can look it up there. Can I ask, was the book translated into into German, and uh, or was it written perhaps originally in German? And uh, what was the response uh, in Germany? What kind of reviews did it get there? Well, the book uh, was initially just a self-published effort in order to, to explain to my children and my grand grandchildren, hopefully, who I was and in what happened. Um, it was translated initially in Portuguese, uh, then into uh, Russian and German, Hebrew. And the German edition I presented uh, four years ago, five years ago in, in my hometown, where for the first time I ever spoke there. Um, and it was very well received. Most of the audience was non-Jewish. And um, it's not about me, what kind of cool guy I am. Absolutely not. I have a healthy ego. Um, I don't need strokes on the pad under my head over my head and a slap on the back and said you're a big great fellow great chap no it was about being honest and try in, in trying to initiate a discussion and were, most of the responses specifically in germany were very positive and we had great discussions and uh, you know the, how we deal with the past the, the questions are flooding in and, and people are uh well they're, they're they're mind blown by the story uh what happened to your original girlfriend that you followed to, to Israel? Oh, hey. Oy vey. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I didn't marry her. She's a wonderful woman. We lost touch. She went to the army. I went to a medical school. But uh, about 10 years ago, I gave an interview on Galei Tzal. Um, and of course, I speak fluent Hebrew. And she noticed, you listened to the interviews, and she told me later, I, li I recognized your voice, but you didn't speak Hebrew when you were with me. So uh, she invited me to come to Israel. A few weeks later, I visited her and a, and a family, a beautiful family. We had a barbecue together and we know each other. So you told us the story of how you and why you made Aliyah to Israel. Uh, but then you've, you've made the journey to the United States. Mm -hmm. And the question uh, from Nicholas is, is why did you uh, make that? Good, good question. Well, in um, 1990, I was discharged after two years of military service and started my uh, medical residency fellow, uh, training in, fam in internal medicine in Israel, in Hadassah. And uh, uh, smack into it in August of 1990, Saddam Hussein decided to invade uh, Kuwait. Kuwait. Uh, we knew that that's bad news. I was immediately drafted in, uh, according to the emergency mobilization mode because I was an expert in uh, or trained in nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare prevention and protection. And uh, we knew that some bad, bad doo-doo will happen. And it happened in January, in 
17th of January 1991 when Saddam Hussein attacked Israel with Scud missiles. And I was actually in an emergency ambulance out Marganita Dome outside in, the, in Tel Aviv. My wife almost lost it and there's no reason why not. And she said, look, after the war ended, uh, I want to go home. She, she um, She's an Israeli American woman. And uh, we decided to, uh, because I know other family, to move to Miami where her family lived, a part of the family. I started residency training and said, maybe I can do three years here and then go back. But our oh, marriage fell apart. I felt responsible for my children and then too. And so I decided to go back and forth to Israel every year and uh, continue my medical work as long as I can before I decide to go back when my children are outgrown, which they are now. And uh, I'm preparing the return, uh, return Aliyah in the next uh, two years at least, carefully, but slowly, but carefully. A number of people are asking about, about your ongoing relationship with your wider family. So your, your brothers and sisters, cousins, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yeah, I didn't know that I have a wider family because my father was very secretive about his family. I've learned that I had a found out just when I was 27 that I had a uncle in Berlin and an aunt in Berlin that my father was not in touch with. And I visited them. So I met my uh, my uncle had a son. I met him. But it was a very small family. Um, my uh, I had a sister. I had two sisters. Um, one sister died uh, 10 years in 2006. I had still the opportunity to catch up with her before she died and helped her. And uh, in my younger sister, she still lives in Bamberg, Germany, in the town that I was born and grown up. And she, we have a good relationship. Again, um, we rebuild a relationship because I disappeared. I totally disappeared. And coming back after 20 years, uh, there was a time, it was difficult to rebuild. But I took the effort and um, and I did. And I'm happy that I have a relationship to at least one surviving member of our family. Uh, Melvin has picked up on your point that when you were growing up in Germany, there was very little awareness amongst uh, your generation in terms of education uh, about, the, about the Holocaust. Is that still the case today? What, what, uh, how has Germany developed in terms of, of Holocaust awareness, Holocaust education, particularly mm -hmm. to young generations? That's a great question, Melvin. Uh, it has changed totally. And of course, it was a struggle. Um, 1945, total destruction of Germany. The Germans were involved after the war to rebuild their country. So they completely wanted to look forward, but not backwards. Er, Mid-50s, uh, the first president in Germany, Theodor Heuss, his first act as a president of West Germany, he, in Berlin, in the, in the same block, where, uh, in the co courtyard of a huge house in the called Block, where Count Klaus von Stauffenberg was executed, he invited all the family members of the resistance to honor them. And it started out from there that the past was creeping in and it was not pleasant for many. First Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt, 1960 to 1962, the perpetrators had suddenly faces um, and the younger generation asked what happened. The upheaval, the battle in the German uh, war, in, in almost civil war, 1966 to 1969, the uh, was then, of course, drift into the extremes of terrorism, of young students fighting the old generation. And then the point uh, that in the complete Wende, as we say in Germany, the turn with the election of Willy Brandt, which, who introduced then uh, the Holocaust education. And in the 70s, very intensive Holocaust education in 80s and 90s. And it's now more genocide prevention education, it's called. What German can learn, what Germans learned. And I had once a moving encounter in Bamberg five years ago with a student in a classroom. She was about 14, 15 years old. When I told my story, she turned to me and said, I don't understand. Well, at first I thought, well, my German really is bad, but it was it's still very good. And she said, no, I understood what you said, but Jews are not different. They're like us. That shows and demonstrates that this we against them is, is over, that young Germans consider Jews as us. And the fact is that we have thousands and thousands of the numbers uh, probably exaggerated, but about 50 to 60,000 Israelis living in Germany with German passports because the German government gives any surviving family members passports. And the Berlin is a thriving Jewish city. Uh, there are 200,000 Jews living in Germany, 100,000 registered in communities. So a lot has changed to the positive. Nothing is ideal. There's anti-Semitism. For example, yesterday, the trial against the um, a terrorist, call him, a German terrorist, young man, 
who during Yom Kippur last year tried to shoot up a synagogue. And thanks to God, his synagogue was reinforced, but he killed two civilians outside. His trial started yesterday. Mm. Indeed. So going back to your family, uh, Nicholas has asked, uh, what was your sister's reaction to your father's story? Well, I disappeared. Uh, it was a shock. I suddenly disappeared and not nothing, never to be heard from. And uh, when I reconnected with my sisters, who initiated de decades later the search for me, uh, they wanted to know what happened. And I had the power and the strength to go back and explain it to him. It was difficult uh, because they considered my move as extreme. I mean, you can don't have to become a Jew, become an Israeli, fight in the army, be in a combat unit who was wounded, and then a, a come back at home and say, is everything hunky-dory? I took the extreme path. And uh, they wanted to know why, and I explained it to them. And uh, we kind of reconciled. That reconciled this, this aspect. So Stuart is, uh, he's asking a question about, about the religious conversion that was according to Halacha. It was a, an mm -hmm. orthodox conversion. So do you live today as, a, as an orthodox Jew, or what, what, where do you fit in the, in the Jewish spectrum? Well, I hope that's a good question. I hope you understand it correctly and, and don't misunderstand it and what I'm going to say now. Um, I have abandoned the term orthodox, conservative, liberal, progressive, constructive, whatever other Jewish terms we use, because in the ramp of Auschwitz, nobody asked people, are you orthodox, reform, or conservative? They killed all of us. And therefore, we are us. We are not separated. Now, that doesn't mean I've escaped the question if I'm a, a Shomer Shabbat. I'm Shomer Shabbat as long as I can. Pikuach Nefesh sometimes takes over where I have to see patients. I only chovesh kippah in in Shabbat, and nobody blames me for that. My my practice looks like a, a, a Israeli tourism industry display with pictures of Israel and, and mezuzah and every door. And actually, I had one student, a Jewish student and a medical student who is Jewish, who asked me, "What is this thing at the door?" I said the mezuzah. Yeah, I never saw that. And I explained to him what it is, and I explained to him about Judaism in the four weeks he was with me. And he became Balich Chazel Lechuva. And so um, I'm a Jew who follows his tradition. I'm more an Israeli than an American Jew. I have a problem with American Jews, not because I don't like them, but I'm socialized as an Israeli Jew. And, uh, I'm, and I go to synagogue, I go to Chabad synagogue with Israelis because it's a little bit more lively. You can talk. Uh, so <laughs> um, maybe I can prescribe myself as a traditional Jew. So uh, I, th I think this will have to be our final question. Uh, Nina has asked, uh, having moved so far away from your, your German roots, uh, did you ever consider changing your name uh, to distance yourself from your father? Good question. <clears throat> I got this question several times. <clears throat> well, here's the answer. Um, when I was in Misrat Apneem, in the Minister of Interior, my uh, I got my Theodat Zud, my first identity, identity card in the paquet. The bureaucrat asked me, Volschläger. We have to shorten that. I said, well, it's really short. Vav, Vav, Lamed, Shin, Lamed, Gimel, Resh. Now, maybe Zimri or Zimmer because it's been ready to wall. I said, leave it like that. Why do I do that? It's very simple. I have now, there's now a Jewish branch of the family in defiance. And uh, I fought my, we have now a solid four panel. Jews in the Jewish branch of the family Volschläger, we don't have to hide. We, we move forward in pride, and uh, that's my name. My Hebrew name is Dov, though. Well, Bernd, Dov, uh, I know you're a practicing doctor. You, you're working in the front line in a pandemic situation. You've been so generous uh, to us with, with your time. On behalf of Mike and David Adom UK and everyone who's listened, I think you've touched so many Thank you. in your story. Uh, just to say a huge thank you to yourself. Thank you to everyone who has watched. I'm sure we have all been extremely moved by it. So once again, thank you so much uh, to you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Rachel, for organizing it. And whenever you come in Miami, hopefully we get it under control. Look me up. Please, God, we will. Thank you. God thank bless you. you.